Hello, I'm Lucrezia Burak and welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories today. Lagos on lockdown. Just how is Africa's biggest city dealing with restrictions on movement to stop the spread of the coronavirus? You know, you, you can have either an offensive or a defensive strategy. Um, I think because of our weaknesses, we've opted for an offensive strategy. So that makes Lagos a very vulnerable city. South Africa, one of the worst hit countries on the continent, starts a mass screening program as it ramps up its effort to control the spread of the virus. And what about the issue with overcrowding and social distancing on the continent? We'll be looking at comparisons with the Ebola outbreak. Hello and welcome to Focus on Africa. Today we've got a special programme looking at government responses in Africa to prevent, identify and treat COVID-19. In the past two weeks, we've seen a concerted effort by nations to implement a number of measures. So today we're asking, what are the challenges? Are they working? What needs to be done? And what lessons from the past health outbreaks could be used to help with the current pandemic. So let's start with the case of Nigeria, where 151 cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed. On Monday, in the, cap the capital, Abuja, the commercial capital, Lagos, and Ogu State were placed under a 14-day lockdown. Social distancing measures have been implemented, but with high population densities and poverty being major concerns, is it enough? Chichi Zundu reports now from Lagos. This is life for the next two weeks. Quiet streets, traffic-free roads, silence. An estimated population of 21 million people are being told to stay indoors. But unlike the rest of the world, time has allowed Nigeria to prepare. It's been nearly four weeks since the first case was confirmed, and so far there have been less than 140. This stadium, now converted into an isolation center, is waiting for patients. When you're at war, you know, you, you can have either an offensive or a defensive strategy. Um, I think because of our weaknesses, we've opted for an offensive strategy. So that makes Lagos a very vulnerable city. And what we've been trying to figure out is how to increase its resilience. So we know that Lagos is a sitting duck for a outbreak scenario. Whilst there's confidence at the top, there's concern on the front line. Two out of every three people live in a slum in Lagos where basic hygiene and social distancing is impossible and there's a real fear that the poorest will suffer the most. One of the city's nurses said Nigeria isn't ready. I'm worried because Nigeria as it all doesn't have enough equipment and infrastructures. So of course I should be worried. Yesterday, in this popular market, before the lockdown started, these women were begging for help. The Lagos state government says that their strategy is working. People are listening and they're staying indoors. So these next two weeks are crucial when it comes to trying to contain the spread of COVID-19. But the big question remains, what happens after 14 days when you allow Africa's most populated city back on the streets? Here, coronavirus is a virus for the privileged, for those with a home to self-isolate in and an ability to buy and stockpile food. The worry is that millions who can't afford the basic advice in the lockdown will be the worst off. Chiji Azundu, Lagos, Nigeria, BBC News. Well, to Ghana now, where coronavirus testing operations have been expanded, the country has recorded 195 positive cases of COVID-19 and five deaths. However, people are recovering. That's important. Over 30 people have fully recovered, although they do remain in quarantine for the moment. And a further 49 are said to be responding well to treatment. The BBC's Thomas Nardi sent us this report. It's the third day of a two-week lockdown of parts of Ghana, including the capital Accra, the second largest city, Kumasi, and the industrial city of Tema. 
These cities are densely populated and identified as hot spots for the spread of the coronavirus. There's restricted movement in the affected cities except for necessities and for people who provide essential services. Public transport is allowed to operate, but with reduced number of passengers to ensure social distancing. The lockdown is to stop the spread of the virus and ensure effective contact tracing and testing of persons who might have come into contact with the patients. Over 35,000 security personnel have been deployed to enforce the directives. There was a mass movement of people from the restricted areas over the weekend to other parts of the country before the lockdown came into effect, and there are concerns the virus could have spread if there were infected persons among them. Ghana's borders remain shut and public gatherings have been banned nationwide. The government has set up a COVID-19 fund and the president has donated a three-month salary to support poor and vulnerable patients. Thomas Nadi, BBC News, Accra. Let's discuss, discuss this further. Joining me live from Accra is uh, Koja Opong Nkurma, the Ghanaian Information Minister. Thank you for speaking us, to us this evening on um, Focus on Africa. First off, um, we must say that you've had a number of recoveries in the country. How have you done that? How have you been treating COVID-19 patients? Um, I think with the benefit of uh, time ahead of us, what we did was to put in place uh, an elaborate system for um, tracing and testing so that when we find positive cases, we're able to aggressively, through the Ghana Health Services, provide the necessary level of treatment. Uh, they have a number of um, drugs and um, uh, protocols that they use to uh, treat persons who have tested positive. So it's that aggressive response early on that has enabled us to have at least currently about 49 people who have been discharged uh, to go home and uh, have an opportunity to be managed from home, and three persons who have uh, fully recovered. What that means is that they have tested negative now after a series of tests after treatment. So, About 108 persons are also responding very well uh, to treatment. Could I just uh, push you on the fact of the, the testing? Are you saying that Ghana has more than enough test kits? Enough is relative. Uh, we have a target of uh, about 50,000 test kits that uh, we desire to bring in. Currently, we've got a little over half of that uh, in the Ghanaian jurisdiction, and the rest is coming in in the coming days. But what we've done is to set up an enhanced testing program. Our strategy is to be ahead of the virus and not to be chasing the virus. What that means is that uh, for persons who are contacts of older persons who are um, uh, affected or who are tested positive, persons in what we call at-risk populations, we are going into these communities, engaging people, and having an aggressive testing program, which is what we believe will help us identify as many as possible positive cases that are out there, and then very quickly deal with it to bring our care down. And in terms of uh, tracing, contact tracing, I mean, we've seen the more extreme um, measures that have been taking place in Singapore, for example, using mobiles and data, people's data. How are you contact tracing? We're using a mix of the traditional um, contact tracing where a positive person tells us uh, his history in the last about uh, four or five days. And through that history, you're able to plot the persons that they've been in contact with. So that's a traditional method on one side and a bit of technology uh, as well. Um, with the benefit of technology today, maybe not necessarily using some of the enhanced data options, but triangulating through cell sites, you're able to tell where these persons have been over a period. So it's a combination of these uh, options that is helping us to uh, identify persons who we believe are at risk and therefore uh, engage them uh, to be tested uh, or, if necessary, have them self-isolate for observation. Now, I know that Ghana works very closely with the WHO and they're really keen on building resilience in um, nation's uh, health systems. How many ICU units have you got? Because so far it seems that, you know, you have had patients who've recovered, but let's just take the worst case scenario. ICU units, ventilators, how are you doing? So suffice to say that currently we do not have any persons in critical condition. Our audits that we have done puts us close to about 200 ICU units between the public sector and the private sector, should we have need for that. We have placed an order for an extra 50 uh, to be quickly brought in, particularly in terms of ventilators and, uh, you know, fitted in some of the 
what that we believe can be upgraded. In addition, we have just rolled out a national ambulance service, who, which has ambulances that are equipped with uh, ventilators, about 300 uh, and seven of them. But those are not ones that you intend to necessarily use for full-time uh, care. Those are for transporting people up and down who may need. Uh, so we continue to observe our logistics uh, status and if need be, work to ramp it up. Okay, Minister Nkrumah, fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing your country's experience. Thank you. Um, well, the latest figures for Africa as it stands, we have now had 49 countries that are affected by COVID-19 with around 6,000 cases and just over 200 deaths. So let's take a look at the key developments across the rest of the world. Now, global stock markets have fallen once again. They've been up and down, haven't they? President Trump warning of hard days ahead for the United States where the virus outbreak has worsened. Tokyo's Nikkei ended the day 4.5% lower US markets opened with sharp falls following the trend set in Asia and Europe. And Spain has suffered yet another record daily death toll. The health ministry says 864 people died in the last 24 hours. The national death toll has now passed 9,000 and there have been more than 100,000 confirmed cases in Spain. But numbers show that the infection rate is continuing to fall. And official media in Iran have increased efforts to tell people to stay at home on the last day of the Persian New Year, known as Nauruz. All parks and public gardens have been closed in the country to prevent people celebrating the holiday with traditional picnics. More than 3,000 people have died from COVID-19 in Iran. And the Wimbledon Tennis Championships have officially been cancelled due to the pandemic. It follows emergency talks at the All England Club, which organises the event. It's the first time since World War II that the tournament has been called off. You're watching Focus on Africa, coming to you from BBC World News. I'm Lequesta Burak. Stay with us because still to come, we're looking at this issue about social distancing and the continent. Does it work? Well, we're going to speak to an expert who helped to coordinate the Ebola crisis response. Our countries are ramping up their efforts to contain this uh, virus. South Africa, which has the highest number of COVID-19 cases in sub-Saharan Africa, currently at just over 1,300 infections and five deaths, has said that they're now starting a mass screening program. It has started, in fact, in their effort to prevent the spread of the virus. Thousands of healthcare workers have been going door to door testing residents for COVID-19 in the densely populated township of Alexandria. BBC's Vuman Mkize reports now from Johannesburg. With over 1,300 infections, South Africa is battling the biggest coronavirus outbreak on the continent. And six days into a 21-day nationwide lockdown, mass testing has begun in vulnerable communities such as Alexandra. Communities around the country can expect to see similar scenes as over 10,000 healthcare workers will be deployed to go door-to-door -door and test for the coronavirus. Here in Alexandra, nine people are in quarantine following a confirmed case in the township. Presently we have discovered some people in this area and that's why we focus today specifically in this particular area. Residents of the impoverished and densely populated community are fearful of the disease and many are heeding government's call to take the outbreak seriously. I have to be scared because I don't know my results yet because this sickness is a serious disease. People are dying, so we are taking it serious. So before you get the results, you are obviously going to be scared because you don't know where you stand. Highly congested communities like Alexandra with little basic services are indicative of how difficult it will be to contain the spread of the coronavirus. Social distancing is almost impossible when people live at such close quarters. Vuman Mkize, BBC News, Johannesburg. So as uh, the cases continue to spread, slowly, albeit, many African countries are urging their citizens to practice social distancing. However, critics say that this simply doesn't work in Africa. And this is because many people, as we heard in uh, Vumani's uh, report there, uh, the vast majority of people in Africa live in crowded areas, sometimes known as townships or slums. And they also work in the informal economy and do not have access to basic social services so they can't afford to stay at home they don't have that luxury 
On the positive side, though, many experts have been saying that Africa has a unique advantage with respect to other regions, and that's because of its experience in fighting Ebola. So let's get a handle on this. We understand the challenges and the possible advantages that Africa faces in this crisis. Um, we are going to speak to David Gressley, who's the Deputy Special Representative of the UN Stabilization Mission in the DRC, and also, more importantly, former UN Emergency Ebola Response Coordinator in the country. Thank you for joining us uh, from Goma uh, today. So. First off, just tell us what challenges you faced when dealing with Ebola. Hello, David, can you hear me? Unfortunately, it looks like we haven't got David. We'll try and re-establish uh, connections there. But just to let you know that uh, tomorrow we have got a special report from uh, Gaius Kawene from the DRC. And he is talking about that uh, Ebola experience uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, should we try again? Um, no, unfortunately, we haven't got David. That, that is a shame. But like I said, uh, join us tomorrow because we have got a special report in terms of the, the Ebola experience on uh, the continent. Now, Ethiopia announced yesterday that it was postponing parliamentary elections scheduled for August due to the coronavirus outbreak. The vote was seen as a key test for the reformist agenda of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Now, Ethiopia is one of the most populous countries in Africa and has 29 coronavirus cases, but numbers are expected to rise. Our reporter, Kalkidan Yebeltel, has more from the capital, Addis, on the reaction to this announcement. Had this been normal times, Ethiopia's electoral board would have started voter registration by the end of the month for landmark elections that were due August this year. But much of its planning had been hit by disruptions that are caused by the global coronavirus pandemic. Obtaining election materials, many of which from abroad, had become difficult. So had training staff. For weeks, the board had been evaluating whether it was possible to go ahead with its already tight schedule amid a looming COVID-19 crisis. So its decision to postpone the first election since Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power with swooping political reforms, was not entirely unexpected. Reacting to the news, some opposition groups have said that right now all the country's focus should be placed in fighting the deadly outbreak. Others, while agreeing with the decision, expressed concern that the ruling party, rebranded and restructured under Abiy Ahmed of the election, might use the opportunity to enhance its grab on power. Ethiopia has seen a surge in political and religious violence since 2018, and some seem to have found a silver lining in the post pandemic as they say this could provide a much needed opportunity to have further dialogue. But this is not to say everybody's on board. A leader of an opposition party told us that the election board should have gone with its plan. But for now, it seems that Ethiopians have to wait more months to see what many believe would be the most significant election in recent decades. Okay, let's go back to Goma and we're going to speak to David um, uh, Gressley, who's going to talk to us about the Ebola experience and how that may help with what we're seeing today with the pandemic. So first off, uh, David, thank you for bearing with us. Um, to what extent do you recognise the complexities and challenges that we're seeing now um, compared to managing Ebola? Well, of course, they're different diseases, but uh, there is a considerable complexity on a more smaller scale here in, in uh, eastern Congo, but very, very complex. Yet underlying that are very simple approaches that in the end made the, made the big difference here uh, to, to bring this epidemic to an end. And what were those changes? What, what did you do to make it work? Well, I think it's important to see these, this, this one in particular more than just a medical response. It has to be a very uh, multidisciplinary, integrated response. And, and what really finished this epidemic in, in Eastern DRC was when the communities locally uh, understood the disease and, and uh, understood what needed to be done to, to, to eradicate it. 
And once that happened, it very quickly collapsed as an epidemic. So that community understanding, a community uh, acceptance is, is a vital part of that. And it has to be everywhere, not just in major urban areas, even some of the more rural areas. So what, I think the second thing that, yeah, go ahead. No, no, so carry on, carry on. I was going to say there's two or three other things I would just highlight. One is getting the basics right. We often talk about vaccines and, and, and treatment, but ultimately getting the basics of surveillance, testing, isolation, which is what ultimately breaks the chain of transmission and treatment is extremely important to get that piece right. And, and, and also understanding that these uh, diseases move very quickly in, mo in the modern world, including here in the Eastern DRC. So you have to be working everywhere all the time if you wanna bring this under control, which is what happened, uh, ultimately what we had to do here in, uh, in Eastern DRC. Now we are dealing with a lot of uh, myth busting, there's a lot of misinformation, and you pointed out there, the key to this is to get the local population to understand the disease. Um, what did it take for them to take that information on board? Well, it, it basically very local work. Uh, um, the understandings sometimes were different, the misunderstandings were different from one locality to another. So you had to work very, very locally and, and work with community leaders, traditional leaders, religious leaders, those people in influence, uh, and, and they can pass that message on correctly. There were a lot of myths here. I won't go into all the details, but there were a lot of myths that had to be overcome. But once the, the communities understood it, and once they saw the reality of the disease, that also made a major difference. Uh, they just got tired of it, and they really worked to, to work with the medical professionals to end the, the epidemic here. Uh, David, did social distancing work in the case of Ebola? Well, it's a different kind of disease. It's, it's actually much harder to, uh, to, to, to get, um, which is very fortunate because it's, the mortality rate is about 65, 67 percent. Um, unlike unlike uh, um, the uh, corona, it is uh, very not only difficult to get, you have to do it through physical contact. So the social distancing was a different. It was there in the sense that uh, you, you, you didn't want to touch someone who was infectious. Also, what was different is people were not infectious. They were before they became symptomatic. They were symptomatic first and then infectious later. So we had a 48 to 72 hour period, a window to isolate people and break the, uh, the, break the chain of transmission, an advantage that you don't have uh, with, with this disease. David, very quickly, if you could answer succinctly, um, the Ebola units that were left in countries, how helpful are they being now with COVID? Extremely. I was just with the governor two days ago here in North Kivu. They're converting those uh, facilities into corona isolation centers. So all that equipment, that expertise, and frankly, the habit of washing our hands, we've been washing our hands for a year and a half here, is well ingrained with everyone. So it's an easier thing to, to work with. David Gressley, it's uh, been an immense pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for your patience as well. Now, just to finish off, tributes have been pouring in for the former president of the French football club Olympique de Marseille, uh, Pape Diouf. On Tuesday, he became the first person to die in Senegal from COVID-19. He was also the first black president of a first-tier European club when he took the position at Marseille in 2005. Previously, he had been a journalist and a football agent. Now, before we go, I just want to remind you, do make sure you join us tomorrow because we're going to get more on the Ebola experience from Gaia Kawane from the DRC. Special report coming to us for us to send to you. Until then, stay safe. You can get in touch on social media. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.